Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, WA. Um, we've got roughly five people in at the moment. Uh, three of the guys from the ENH office from WA and a couple from Water Corp. So we're just going to give it a few more minutes um, before we get going, which will be at 10 a.m. your time. Guys, and for those of you who are in the meeting already, on the dashboard, you'll see that there's the ability to raise your hand. If you can hear me and the sound's all good, can you just raise your hand? Josh is raised. John's there. Fatigue. Perfect. Okay. George. Awesome. All right. Thanks. The sound's all good. Looks like we've got six so far, and looks like David's just joined as well, which is brilliant. David, can you just raise your hand on, on the dashboard if you can hear me okay? Yeah, okay, <laughs> the hand's somewhere hidden in that dashboard. It should be a, a column in there. Okay, guys, um, I think we'll, we'll get going. If the others uh, are joining, that's okay, because um, we've got quite a bit to get through in the next um, hour or so. Um, so welcome, firstly. So this, we're, we're holding a webinar today. We, we originally meant to come to, to Perth um, with Josh and John and George from the office in WA um, to present a customer webinar, uh, seminar, sorry, and that was meant to be this month, but obviously with everything that's happened over the past six weeks and we've had to completely change the plans with, with no travel allowed. So I've been in contact with David and, and instead we're just going to hold this um, webinar instead uh, to focus on a couple of topics that you guys are interested in at Water Corporation, that being IIoT 4.0, remote monitoring solutions and also the Promag W0DN flow meter. Um, so just before we get going, I know a few of you at WaterCorp did attend the, the Promag Zero DN webinar, so you would have seen this interface before. But for those of you who haven't, this is what your screen should look like. Today, we're not going to be using the webcam. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see your dashboard. So there's a, a handouts section. I'll send you the slides after this presentation, so ignore that. And there's also a section for questions as well. So the way we'll run this today, because we, we've, we've only got an hour, we're going to ask you to ask those questions throughout the webinar. And then at the end, we'll have some time, hopefully around 10 minutes, to answer those questions. Um, at this stage, I've muted all of your microphones. Otherwise, we can have 10, 12 people talking at once. But if you also want to ask a question uh, using your microphone, um, just raise your hand as well, and then I can unmute you, and then you can answer questions that way as well. So just to confirm, we'll do all the questions at the end. So your speakers today, firstly, myself. So my name's Luke. I am the industry manager for water and wastewater. I've been with Endress and Hauser three years on Monday. 
Um, previously, I was in a sales role for water and wastewater in Southeast Queensland. And we've also got Ali Hafiz here. So Ali, over to you. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, just a quick introduction. So like uh, like Luke, I joined uh, Anderson Hauser as industry manager for chem oil and gas industry originally, um, and also doing product support for the gas analytical portfolio, which is a largely well-kept secret <laughs> at ENH, uh, but now looking after uh, major projects, key accounts and the solutions division for ENH Australia, um, the latter being the reason why I'm here today. And yeah, five years at ENH on Friday. Um, so look forward to going through this with you guys. Perfect. Thanks, Ali. Um, and we've also got three people from the WA office on the line. Those are George McMurty, who's the state um, manager for WA. For Anderson Hauser, we also have Joshua Chan. Many of you at Watercourt would be familiar with Josh Chan. He was your account manager for a few years. Um, and then we also have John Wilson, who is your new account manager for Water Corporation, all based over in, in Perth. So on the agenda today, so I will be doing a brief introduction to IIoT 4.0 and what it means for the water and wastewater industry. Then I'll pass it over to Ali, who's going to give you some real life applications of IIoT 4.0 for the water and wastewater industry. After that, I'll have some slides to discuss our, our brand new flow meter option, that's the Promag Zero DN. And then, like I mentioned before, we'll leave uh, everybody around 10 minutes to answer some questions. So into my slide. So the what, the why, and the how of IIoT 4.0 for water. So for many of you, this, this diagram or a similar version of this diagram will be familiar, it explains that the various um, uh, positions for industry over the last uh, couple of centuries. So industry 1.0, which think about mechanization, steam, power, uh, moving on to industry 2.0, where, where the introduction of electricity to increase the efficiency of processes. Then in the late 60s, we had interest industry 3.0, so the use of automation for control purposes, computers, electronics. And now into industry 4.0, um, which was where we are today. So what is industry 4.0? So it's a collective term for technologies and concepts of value chain organization. And the whole point of industry 4.0 or the main point of it is to, is to increase the efficiency of your processes. Now there's six design principles of IIoT 4.0. So you may have seen these before. So they're listed on, on the left-hand side there. So you'll have interoperability. So the ability of machinery and components to communicate through networks and virtualization, decentralization, real-term capability, service orientation and modularity. Um, you'll see in the central column an explanation for, for each of those. And then the right-hand side is, is where we are with, with water. So for some aspects of these six principles, we, we're doing really well. So decentralization. So arguably this, this already exists for water and has done for a number of years. But there are some other areas where, where we could do with some improvement. That would be, say, service orientation, interoperability, and those kind of things. There's certainly area for improvement. We have seen excuse me, we have seen some, some big improvements in those areas in, in recent years, particularly in, in real-term capability, but there's still some aspects we can improve and, and Ali will go on to discuss some examples we have in the industry at the moment. So this graph is just an overview of, of the global expenditure in smart networks in the water industry since 2013. So as you can see, it's consistently improving, uh, increasing, excuse me, year on year. So there really is a huge investment in IIoT 4.0. Um, and here's just an, an example of the, the investment in different areas of IIoT. So this is by the layers. So on the left-hand side, we're, you can see we're, we're essentially dealing with five layers for IOT, the physical layers, so that being the pipes and your networks, the sensors, the control, communications, data management, fusion and analysis. Now, all these four areas above the physical layer, that's where Andrus and Hauser come in. And, and we've been working for a number of years on this area. And, and today we do have some IOT ready solutions, so completely ready for, for the market. 
So the whole aim for IIoT and, and what we now know as Water 4.0 is to go from data, so having all this data that we have available that, that Ali's going to talk to you about in a second, and really having absolute value for that data. So being able to improve the efficiency of processes, energy efficiency, improve security, improve distribution networks, all the things that you'll be very familiar with at WaterCorp, and this is what we're working on now. So keep this diagram in mind, so it's about having all that data and then really turning that data to, to value. Now what Ali, I'm going to pass over to Ali now, and he's going to talk to you about some, some actual examples of IoT in the water industry and what Andrews and Hauser have done as well. So Ali, I'm just going to give you control of the slides right now, so just give me one second. So Ali, this should have come through to you, just if you can share your screen. Perfect. Okay, <clears throat> so thanks for that. Um, right, so IIoT, uh, and I thought I'd start with one of my favorite uh, memes or memes or whatever people call them. Uh, plenty to unpack here, but I guess if I had to personalize this, uh, it would read something like, number one buzzwords, number two irony, and then three lists and so on. So let's face it, IoT and its industrial cousin IIoT are often used buzzwords that have nearly lost meaning uh, over the last few years. Um, everything's IoT, everything's a thing, and everything's connected to the internet, and the fridge of the future will stop you from buying pepperoni because it's bad for you, and you know, who needs that? Um, while there might be arguments that in our personal lives, uh, internet connected things make us lazier and more reliant on technology, in an industrial sense, um, one might argue that in fact there is untapped benefit here. When we think of large infrastructure uh, geographically spread or industrial facilities with hazardous areas, limiting how much physical time is spent on site can increase safety and productivity. Um, so if you have thousands of miles of water pipelines and you had a leak, would you rather spend time looking for a leak or have a smart system that tells you where the leak is and then focus on fixing it? Um, as an instrumentation manufacturer, this is where we see IoT fitting in. Um, Today, I'll, I'll give you an idea of Natillion, which is the ENH IoT ecosystem, why it exists, what it can offer, and then focus in particular on the water network solutions. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are an instrumentation manufacturer. We have upwards of 40 million devices installed worldwide. Uh, if each of these instruments was only measuring a single variable, then we're talking about 40 million data points. Uh, of course, if you take an instrument like the Promag W, which Luke will talk about later in this webinar, then we're talking about over 50 additional parameters that can be transmitted. So these include multiple process variables, totalizer values, and a truckload of diagnostic parameters such as you know, internal resistances, uh, coil voltages, signal damping, and on and on. Uh, now, if our sales engineers have been doing their job, you'll have heard of Heartbeat Diagnostics from Anderson Hauser as well, which gives you uh, access to detailed diagnostic parameters within the instruments. Uh, so if you now multiply the, the, the available parameters with the number of installed base units, suddenly we're going from 40 million data points to billions of data points. Uh, unfortunately, in the majority of cases, uh, this additional data is not being utilized by our customers. So you're paying for it and it's there, but likely you're not using it. Um, almost 90% of the ENH portfolio is already digitalized. Uh, we offer the ability to draw information out of instruments via protocols ranging from the, you know, the oldies, and, but the goldies like Modbus and Heart, to the more innovative uh, MemoSense, Heartbeat, and lately now even Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Um, so how do we unlock all this uh, information that's available? Um, Typically, getting at this additional data has been difficult, uh, mostly because of existing control infrastructure where analog connections like 420 milliamp um, you know, uh, loops uh, already exist between the instrument and the DCS or PLC. Um, and introducing a change in that existing architecture can be cost prohibitive. So ENH's solution is to bypass the traditional control architecture altogether all um, or, or 
in other words, leave it untouched, uh, because the data we are interested in getting out of the instruments isn't necessarily pertinent to the process control. So we're talking about getting diagnostic information to optimize maintenance or monitor data for reconciliation, um, overall network availability, health predictions, and this kind of stuff. So this is not high-speed process data. We're talking about update times once every few minutes, maybe even hours, uh, maybe even once a day, rather than four to 10 uh, millisecond updates. Uh, if we take just a single uh, instrument, if it's a legacy model or a traditional 420 milliamp or heart device, uh, then the, the infrastructure would look uh, somewhat similar to, to the ones in the bottom right, where uh, the instrument would uh, be wired into an edge device, which then transmits uh, directly to the cloud, which is marked here as Natillion. Um, and then from that cloud, we run other services. Uh, so the the architecture is quite simple, um, uh, and yeah, so we'll delve a bit further into Natillion now. I would like to point out there's a couple of instruments here that are in the green circles, and, and this is something that's now Anderson Hazard's uh, future focus, which is IoT-ready devices. So one of the the further ways we're trying to implement uh, the simplify. Uh, the, the infrastructure is by actually having our devices able to talk directly to our Natillion cloud without even needing an edge device. So they already have a, um, a, a 3G uh, modem built into the devices uh, and pre-configured to talk to cloud. So that's where Anderson Hauser's um, technology is headed. Uh, but we'll cover more of that. Just to give you an idea of Natillion, uh, which is our IIoT ecosystem, I'm not going to go through this in, in complete uh, detail. Um, but as you can see from the graphic, uh, ENH is now ensuring that newer generations of instrumentation are already IoT ready. Uh, we already have an IoT radar. Um, that's available uh, and released in Europe and in Australia, hopefully by the end of May. Um, so these are the devices that are in the bottom uh, section, which is Natillion Ready section. Uh, however, whether you have the latest IoT instruments or existing instruments, we have a wide range of gateways which can be utilized to send data straight into the cloud um, where we can provide information like diagnostics and measured values and status and so on. Um, these uh, or this data and information then goes into Natillion services, which is the top left uh, side of the graphic, uh, and that includes, you know, analytics, health, uh, library, which is sort of access to the instruction manuals and safety manuals and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then as you move across to the top right of the graphic, you see integration with other systems like SAP, SCADA, uh, and this is sort of the cusp of where the water network solution sits, which is what we're going to talk about um, in this webinar. So as a quick recap so far, we have the process sensors, uh, IoT Ready uh, uh, is the future uh, for ENH. Um, we get the, uh, the information from the process sensors. We have IoT components uh, like gateways and edge devices to get that information transmitted into the cloud. Then we have the asset management side, which is to do with the health and the library and the value apps. Uh, and now we move into the water network, uh, which is more application-based performance um, to, to sort of complete and round out that portfolio with future development to come on a plant-wide performance um, dashboards. Right. so. In respect to water, there's a famous quote that says, thousands have lived without love, not one without water. So obviously we all rely on water. It makes sense that we want to monitor its usage, especially in the world's driest inhabited uh, continent. Um, I had to put inhabited in there because apparently Antarctica is technically the driest continent in the world, uh, which seems pretty counterintuitive, um, but there we go. So we have a variety of applications ranging from extraction, distribution, and storage. Uh, and typically there are multiple networks which cover different regions, areas, and applications. Um, 
When it comes to water networks, obviously flow becomes the most important measurement uh, and typically in distributed water networks, we're looking at potentially remote locations with possibility of no power. ENH has basically reimagined the original battery mag, uh, magnetic flow meter, uh, and developed a roadmap for the product, bringing it in line with our new IoT offering. Um, this means that the battery mag is being revamped uh, and I believe due to be released uh, Q3 2020, if I'm not mistaken, but we'll, we'll confirm that later. Uh, and it's to be released as a new IoT ready device. Uh, so as I mentioned previously, this means that you no longer have to patch together a do-it-yourself solution to push the signal from, uh, from a remote mag into some sort of gateway and then into a 3G LTE modem. Uh, the device uh, that we're looking to release soon will, will have an inbuilt uh, telecom modem enabling it to directly communicate via IoT protocols like MQTT to our, to our cloud solution, uh, enabling users to get data straight away on any mobile or internet-ready device. Uh, of course, this will also harness the full power of our diagnostic functions like heartbeat as well, um, so that you're not only going to get the flow rate, but you can also get a window into the condition of your remote instrument. For example, where there is a malfunction on the device or something is starting to drift out of tolerance, you would be able to pick up things, um, you know, like build up detection on coils as an example. Uh, this becomes particularly important because on the off chance something goes wrong with the device uh, on the measurement side and it's still transmitting diagnostic diagnostic data, you could potentially troubleshoot before you go to the remote location already armed with the right tools, uh, as opposed to maybe driving out, finding out what's wrong, coming back, picking up the right tools or spare parts and so on. Um, right, so we've seen what Antillian ecosystem looks like and how it works with the instruments. So uh, what I wanted to do is provide a couple of use cases for this based on some of the trials that ENH has already done with customers. So as this is part of our latest technology portfolio, we're still in the process of launching it across the world. Uh, luckily, Australia is part of the first rollout, so Natillion is already active here. Uh, we are amongst the first in line also to get the IoT-ready devices um, as they become available. Um, yeah. If you recall uh, what Luke mentioned uh, at the introduction of this webinar, there are six design principles for IoT. Uh, so there's, there were interoperability, uh, decentralization, and so on. Uh, the ones we're going to focus on for the water network solution are real-time capability or, or monitoring of data, uh, decentralization, and, and service orientation. So we'll ex explore these through, through two use cases, uh, which are sort of highlighted in purple there. So um, this is a snapshot of a real dashboard running on Natillion. So it's a good all-rounder, which is why I included it here. Um, and yes, it's it's in German, so so bear bear with me on that. But as you can see, it shows a partial network uh, network where you can see uh, the the well the neater zone, which I think is the low zone, um, uh, and it has the zone flow rates there. Um, uh, we can also run a comparison if this is in a is monitoring a network feeding into this zone so we can work out losses along the way for example so if if there's flow measurement uh, upstream in the network we can we can do a summation and do a compare and work out if you know there's been a loss somewhere along the way uh, there's also level monitoring uh, on the high zone storage reservoir reservoir so that's just so you can bear in mind that we aren't just talking about flow meters here but we're able to integrate all instrument parameters in into the cloud um, and then of course finally uh, towards the bottom uh, you can see the the water quality side as well uh, which is looking at um, turbidity uh, measurement uh, for example so we'll go into that a bit more um, yeah so the basis of it really is to talk about uh, you know, secure web-based digital services, and I should point out that the Natillion um, security, uh, we had to we had to get that approved according to the EU regulations, which are quite stringent. Uh, so it's you know bank bank level security on data um, uh, and all that kind of stuff. It requires the authorizations and all, all password protection and encryption. Um, so we sort of address all those um, requirements as well. So we come to our first uh, use case, uh, which is a water authority looking uh, to monitor effluent water from multiple industrial sites um, at each industrial site. So you can see there's a there's a flow meter uh, paired with our 
analyzer solutions. So in this example, uh, they're using pH conductivity and a sample analyzer for detection of complex parameters like TOC, COD, and SAC. Uh, again, the architecture is the same. So we tie up the outputs of the instruments, transmit them via an edge device uh, to the cloud uh, where it is then accessed by the authorities. Um, this is a water treatment company in Italy who want to monitor the quality of the incoming water to their treatment facilities. Uh, so with a variety of pollutants that, that might be coming in, they're able to tweak and optimize their treatment process. So in addition to that, uh, they could potentially also use the data to monitor which sites are consistently uh, going out of tolerance or putting pollutants in the water as a way of maybe retrospectively finding them or billing them. So this is sort of the, the brief that the, this company um, sort of provided to Anderson Hauser as part of this trial. Um, so there's many ways that this technology can be applied, but obviously it has to start with data transparency and that's what, what the vision for the IoT um, offering from Anderson Hauser is all about. Uh, this customer wanted a Google Maps style interface, so we can provide that as well. So they can click on the, the various industrial sites and, and then they see the more data uh, detail there. Um, and then if uh, they can delve into that, uh, you can see additional live values as well. So they can see the temperature, the pH, the conductivity, plus historical trends and, and so on. Right. The next uh, use case is from Germany. Uh, so this is the one I showed you a sample screenshot from before as well. Uh, this is for monitoring decentralized assets. So in this case, uh, there's a municipal uh, authority that wanted to monitor 19 facilities that are partially connected to each other over an area of about 165 square kilometers. Um, in this instance, the facilities are, of course, spread over a large area. They had only four personnel to monitor all the data, uh, and the issue was compounded by poor mobile network coverage as well. So in this instance, we actually used a low power wide area radio network to gather the data from the sites and upload to the cloud. Um, and of course, the, the advantage of this is greatly reducing the times uh, the operators had to spend going from facility to facility to take notes and recordings and data and also unnecessary uh, troubleshooting as well. So here I have uh, another screenshot which shows an overview of the facilities. Uh, it shows a green dot. Uh, on the side of the facility, which basically says everything is healthy and gives you a quick overview of each facility and how much the areas connected to the facility are drawing or, or feeding into the, the reservoirs connected to the facility. Um, so the benefit to this customer, of course, is, is, is the time saving, but also proactive maintenance, which is the third aspect of that IoT design, which is a uh, service uh, monitoring as well, or service optimization. Because if there is a fault on the instruments, um, that, that can be detected while the electronics are still able to transmit the error message, then the operators are also forearmed on potential remedies, um, not to mention a more regular and accurate record of data as well. So the next steps uh, we are working on with this customers are things like artificial intelligence to estimate water quality ratings. Um, in this dashboard uh, screenshot, as, as you might notice across the top uh, in the small text, uh, you can see that it actually integrates information from the local weather bureau's uh, web API as well. And what this customer wants to do is uh, try to do predictive reservoir management, which is if there's rain, um, there may be a, a lag uh, before the runoff accumulates or through the stormwater system. And the aim they want to achieve is to manage their reservoirs such that they can preempt increased levels uh, in the reservoirs uh, due to rain events and manage the inventory by pumping uh, the reservoirs um, further down downstream uh, so they can handle the additional water. Um, and that's really the, the next step uh, of where we're going with this. Um, yeah, so thank you, thank you for your time. Uh, I think that's my time, so I'll hand back over to Luke now if I can work out how to do it. Perfect, I'll wait here, Ellie, and I'll wait for you to, to hand it over. So thanks so much for, for that. So as you can see, it was um, 
it was an overview of the, of the kind of IOC or IOC systems that, that we're offering here in for Anderson Housing. Um, and we do have plenty more on the way towards the end of this year, as Ali had mentioned, we're going to be releasing the new Promac W800 to the fully IoT ready battery solution. And uh, we do have or will have within the next month an IoT ready level monitoring solution as well. So Ali, thanks for that. It's a really brilliant overview. Now I'm going to talk to you about the Promag W0 at the end. So we've already spoke about flow metering or Ali has with the IoT solutions. Um, this is a brand new flow meter. And we did do a webinar, I think towards the end of March and a couple from Watercourt did attend that webinar um, as well. So I just wanted to, to give you an overview for those who did miss it um, of what this new flow meter is about. So in short, it's the first and only electromagnetic flow meter combining zero inlet and outlet runs with a full bore design, um, completely independent of the flow profile. So in the past, we've previously developed but we also had a zero DN flow meter, which had a constricted measuring tube. Issues with that is that it's gonna cause a pressure drop, which is gonna increase pumping costs as well. And you also may get some further issues downstream. So with the Promag zero DN, it's no longer a constricted measuring tube. It's a full bore flow meter that can be installed in, in any application. So typically in the past, as many of you may know, um, electromagnetic flow meter for, for any install would require five nominal diameters upstream and two nominal diameters downstream of an obstruction, whether that be a 90 degree bend, a valve, for example, um, a constriction in the measuring tube, that's what you always had to abide by. With the zero DN, you no longer have to do that. So you can install it straight after a bend, for example, in T fittings, insertion devices, and so on. So really, it's a perfect flow meter for those space restricted situations. Uh, for example, in pump stations or some larger diameter flow meters on water treatment or wastewater treatment sites, it's the perfect install for that. In a few slides time, I'll show you some images of some flow meters that we've actually installed. Um, and we've actually recently quoted one for, for a job in Water Corporation as well. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, this zero DM flow meter is can be installed completely independent of the flow profile. So what this diagram shows you is, is the kind of changes in the velocity profile that you can expect after a 90 degree bend. So here, on the um, vertical se section, it's nice and straight. As soon as we hit that bend, the velocity profile is all over the place. Now this is previously a nightmare for magnetic flow meters. They couldn't average out that velocity profile. You'd end up with a result, result which could be five, 10, 15% error on top of your normal result. So with a zero DN, you don't have to worry about those profiles. And I'll show you an image of, of how we can do that as well. So, some cornerstones of the Promag Zero DN. So these are all listed here. So available in, in any flanges, welded, lap joint, high pressure, low pressure. For any transmitter, the new Proline 3 series, so the 300, the 400, the 500 transmitters. I know that at Beanup, you've got plenty of the 500 series transmitters installed and also in other sections, the 400s. And the Zero DN is available with all of those. Um, nominal diameters. So I've got here one inch up to 300 mil. As of Q3 2020, larger diameter flow meters will be available with the zero DN option. In fact, we've, we've already quoted 450, 600, 900, 1800 mil mags already. These are currently available as, as custom. By Q3, they'll be available as standard and we can go as high as 2.4 meters um, with, with our calibration factory over in Europe. Probably won't be installed in Australia, but there's plenty of installs, for example, in America that do require that size of flow meters. Liners, your standard liners for water and wastewater, so polyurethane, hard rubber, PTFE, um, and error. We've got here the default error of 0.5%. We can go down to 0.2%. We, we're also working um, with some calibration facilities in Australia, for example, NMI, to have this approved in NMI um, flow metering as well. So here is how we do it. So what they've done, what the, the R&D team have done is they've put an extra pair of electrodes inside this flow meter. So rather than having two, which are your measuring electrodes, um, you can see on the left and, and the right hand side, they now have four electrodes for flow meters from 25 up to 65 mil. From 80 above, they have six electrodes and they space these around the flow meter. And what that does, it works with a special 
um, integration system with inside, within the transmitter to, to average out those flow velocity profiles and, and give you the correct results. And we've done some third party testing on this, so it's not just us, but have done it. And I'll show you some examples of that in a few slides time as well. So it looks fairly simple, but, but trust me, it took them quite a few years to, to work this out. Um, and the key thing is that, yeah, we from 300 above, we still just work with the six electrodes. So even with your huge mags, like your 1600, your 1800 mil mags, we still have the six electrodes around uh, the flow center. So here's some examples of, of where they can work. So classic insulation, you've got a 90 degree bend before and after the flow meter. Previously, that gave you horrendous velocity profiles, as you saw in the previous slide. There was no chance that you can install a mag in that installation. Now you can. Another installation, which you probably aren't too aware of, is, is insertion devices. They can also cause some turbulence within your flow stream, which can cause changes in your velocity profile and then inaccuracy in your measurements for the zero DN that's no longer an issue. Another example is build up in the pipe, particularly, for example, on your raw water lines or your raw wastewater lines, they can build up at some point, which can cause a constriction within your flow tube, which will then cause a, a, an error in your results with the zero DN. Don't worry about that anymore. We've got those additional electrodes to, to counteract against that. Also for misaligned, um, misaligned all nominal diameter differences. So this, you could be, for example, installing a flow meter in quite an old pipe. You can't find the same pipe uh, with the new install. So you end up with a change in the nominal diameter, which can cause a change in your velocity profile with the zero DN. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, and similarly with T-fittings and misaligned ceilings, again, the zero DN would be the option there. So I'll show you some examples um, in a few slides time, but we've seen quite a bit of success with this flow meter, particularly in those compact designs, pump stations, for example, we're installing quite a few of these flow meters. So I'll show you some examples in a second. As I mentioned before, this is also third party verified. So we took this flow meter to a calibration facility in the UK and ran all sorts of tests with different line sizes. So in this example here, uh, it's installed directly after a 90 degree bend. This is a DN250 mil flow meter. On the X axis, you'll see the flow velocity. On the Y axis, you'll see the percentage error. The dashed lines represent where you need to be for a 0.5% calibrated flow meter. And the blue squares represent where we were. So even at those real low velocities, we were still well within the specifications for a 0.5% um, error flow meter. Similarly, we've done some tests with orifice plates. So we do have some examples where I'm based over in Queensland where they have uh, installed an orifice plate flow meter on the raw water line. These were installed 25 years ago. They're, they're well past their use by date. They need to install a mag flow meter. We've done tests with an orifice plate installed, um, which can cause changes in the velocity profile. We're still well within um, the accuracy limits for a 0.5% mil flow meter. Another example here, you would have seen a, a nice 3D image on, on the previous slide. This one's installed straight after a 90 degree bend. So we've got the inlet coming in here, 90 degree up, 90 degree right, 90 degree down, then a mag installed there. So you can imagine the sort of turbulence that you're going to get from all of these bends here. We installed the zero DN flow meter. And as you can see here, we're well within that dash line for, for accuracy. So we've done these third party tests. These are available as well, and I can send to you um, if you wish to see them. So where is this position price wise? Well, it's only 5% above a standard flow meter. So if you order, say, 100 mil mag, PN16 flanges, and then you want the zero DN because you've got a really tight skill insulation on a pump booster step, for example, with the zero DN, it's only 5% above the standard price. So it's priced really well and will be for the next couple of years as well. So probably slides that you're really interested in is what are the applications? So I explained some before and we've listed some here as well. So we've got district cooling applications, desalination applications. So I'll show you some pictures of those in a second. So for large diameter flow meters on the water intake or for, for the low pressure membrane treatments. Wastewater treatments anywhere on the wastewater treatment site as well as a water treatment site. Some examples we've seen a lot of inquiries for recently is pump stations, so those really compact pump booster sets. We were installing zero DM flow meters on those as well. Obviously, your entire water supply network um, and in skid building as well. 
So on the next slide, I've just shown you some pictures. So these could be great applications for the zero DN. So first you'll see on the left-hand side, this is a picture I took at a site in Queensland on an MBBR outlet. So on that, they've got six lines coming off for all, all 450 mil each. If they wanted to go by the standard application, the 5DN on the inlet, 2DN on the outlet, which is roughly say two meters and, and one meter on each side. Um, with the 0DN, you could compress the entire size of that skid. Uh, so the concrete pad size reduces, your piping requirements reduce, you can save pretty significant costs by installing a 0DN rather than a standard flow meter. Similarly, a desalination plant, we've got huge mags coming in there. I know a couple of sites in Queensland, we've got 750, 900 mil mags. You do require a lot of pipe for those installations, as you can see in this, in this diagram, in, the, in this image in the middle here. With the zero DN, you can suddenly reduce the entire size of that insulation. So if you combine the cost of not only the piping and the pad, the whole building, you can really save some huge costs. And as I've mentioned a few times as well, for, for, for QU here in Queensland, we're working on installing these flow meters on pump booster sets for, for water distribution and for sewage pump stations as well. Here's some actual examples. So you can see on the left hand side, this is a huge mag we've, we've just supplied over in Houston in, in America. So I've actually got the line size wrong there. This is a 2.4 meter mag that we supplied with, with the zero DN option as part of, of the outlet of a, as a, of a reservoir, excuse me. So if you add on all the piping requirements for that, you're looking at 12 meters of this huge pipe. The cost of the crane to install everything, they're gonna be huge. With the zero DN, they can suddenly reduce that entire line size as well. On the right hand side as well, this is a fairly recent installation down in Victoria. So we've got this installed pretty much straight after this uh, binary flow control valve. So rather than having to extend all their piping network upwards, they've just installed it straight afterwards and this flow meter is working really well there. As I've mentioned a few times before in these skid designs on these reverse osmosis plants, low pressure membrane filtration plants, all of these sites you can now install the zero DM flow meters. So plenty of places for installations. Um, as I've mentioned, we've, we've been talking uh, to some people for installs over at the Beanie Up site as well. So yeah, there's a lot of potential for these flow meters. So guys, that's it. We've stopped a, a little bit early, so we've got plenty of time for, for questions. I can see that we've had quite a few questions from David. Um, so Ali, I think most of these are gonna be from you at the start. So I'm just gonna assign that question to you and just let me know if that pops up in your screen, Ali. Yep, so I'm just... Uh going to make this a bit bigger. All right. So the question I see is, can we use Natillion over the SCADA WAN to centralize independent server, or is it just web? based. Um, so we can uh, use it over SCADA WAN as well, um, uh, but it, it eventually it for for it to be part of Natillion it does have to go into the the cloud because that's where we do our data processing um, so it wouldn't just uh, be able to be um, I guess centralized into a server um, locally um, hopefully that answers that question what com options are or will be available yes uh so we're looking at a few uh nb iot uh absolutely so uh narrow that's the narrowband iot uh that's the the go-to on the iot ready devices like the radar that i mentioned um that's nb iot uh for the for the low power um radio we are using LoRaWAN. so the example i showed a, in germany actually uses LoRaWAN exactly and then we also support 3g 4g uh, the the bands that we support currently are uh, I'd have to double check but they're the B1 B2 
two, I think B28 is in the works. I think B28 is related to the Telstra Combs. Um, um, so that one's still in development um, because uh, the way our IoT uh, devices are currently set up, uh, we use a Swisscom um, SIM, which has global roaming on it. So basically it's fully integrated. Um, and Swisscom has an agreement with Vodafone, Optus and Telstra on 3G, 4G comms, but not yet on NB-IoT because they're still being released um, uh, or in the process of being released. Uh, so we are currently testing on Vodafone um, and then Telstra is the next uh, next one off the ranks. But yeah, it's, it's one of our... Uh, it's definitely one of our high priorities from an Australian point of view because uh, we know Telstra has the best coverage uh, in remote areas, uh, especially. Cool. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ali. We've got a few questions on the zero DN, which I think I'll answer those ones. So, a question from David: The flow meter accuracy isn't any less than the standard install MagFlow, correct? And um, so, David, the, the standard accuracy for these mags, in fact, probably most of the mags we supply, is 0.5%. And you can get down to 0.2%, and you can also do NATO accredited fully traceable calibration down to that level as well. And um, what our tests have shown, um, and we do have some examples of that that I can send you separately, is that we find that, that we're further within the tolerance with this zero dn flow meter than we are with the standard mags so with these additional electrodes we're really able to get super accurate results so so if accuracy is is your thing and that's what you really require as well as installing these mags in those compact installations then, then the zero dn is the mag to go for there and there's another question about full pipe principles do they still apply yep absolutely as with all mags we still need a, a full pipe in order to, to measure correctly there. Um, and the question was, why would we not use this meter over the traditional time? Um, look, I've, I've briefly mentioned before, we've got a nice diagram, but I haven't showed in here, but really this flow meter can be used over a number of different applications. So not only those compact installations, but if you're looking for real high accuracy on, on the flow meter, this, this, this is the one to install. Why would you not install it? I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, cost-wise, it's, it's quite attractive as well. It's only 5% higher than the normal mag. Um, so there's plenty of possibilities. But of course, if you still wanted the standard mags, those are, will be available and will be fully available for a number of years to come as well. So Michael's asked a question about the verification options um, for this flow meter. Michael, these are all these zero DM flow meters are available with all the, the latest series of transmitters. So the 300, the 400, the 500 series. Um, heartbeat verification is, is absolutely still available for all of those. And I, I know that in recent projects in WA, um, you've installed heartbeat verifications for those flow meters. So yes, with the zero, with the zero DM, still absolutely available. Do we have any more questions? Does anybody want to answer anything in person as well? Um, I'll unmute Josh. Josh, you've raised your hand. Yes, I have Luke. Um, Luke and Ali, can you actually hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can yeah. You everyone else? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, uh, Luke and Ali, uh, thanks so much for this uh, very insightful, uh, insightful presentation. Um, really, we, we learned quite a bit, and I'm sure the water cop. Uh, um, um, they, they can actually learn a lot from, from what we have just spoken about. Um, probably wanted to talk about the second last question um, from, from the panel and, and basically why do we actually not um, you know, use it over traditional flow meters? Well, the, the answer is, to be honest, I think for the future right now with, with uh, Andres and Hauser coming out with this new meter, we would actually you know, recommend that to be you know, put in the preferred vendor list you know, in, in, in terms of the, uh, the requirements. And the reason is there are a lot of uh, requirements that we actually do not look at in the past. Like, as Luke is saying, you know, the, the mis misalignment of the piping um, uh, with, with, you know, the different inlets and, and stuff like that. And a lot of these cases actually have not been looked into. And uh, with, with all this now, with the zero inlet uh, technology being in there, uh, the accuracy of the flow will be much, you know, uh, updated and, of course, improved as well. So... 
to be honest, I think then th this would be a very good technology bringing in. Um, and then I will be uh, suggesting that more of these meters be, be tried on as well to see its performance. Thank you. Cool, thanks Josh. And, and there was just another technical question from, from David there is, um, will they have remote transmitters as, as well as compact? Um, yeah, absolutely, David, uh, remote versions as well as compact are available in the zero DM moment. Yeah, so I've also included uh, text answers uh, to those questions, hopefully, but more than happy to to sort of uh, investigate them outside of this webinar with with, with WaterCorp as well. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so everybody, if there's not any more questions, so just just a brief um, summary of, of what we've just gone over in the last um, 50 minutes or so. So we've gone through some IIoT solutions for Endress and how to offer. And, and as Ali mentioned, if you do have any any potential solutions at WaterCorp, let us know. Let myself know, or Josh, John, George, and, and we can discuss those further offline. And um, we've also introduced the, the zero DM flow meter. So for use in, in many, many different applications. And as Josh mentioned, it's really sort of the top flow meter that we offer in terms of accuracy. And, uh, and it's one that, that no one else is able to produce at the moment as well. Um, and then we had some great questions regarding um, IOT solutions as well from, from David. Um, I will send you an email and we'll respond to each of those individually as well. So you have some written responses to those. Um, and that's about it. So thanks everybody. Thanks for taking the time. I know you're all very, very busy at the moment, but but we really appreciate your time and I'll follow up with an email with the slides and uh, and then let us know if you need any more information. Yep, thank you everyone. Cool, thanks Ali.